So um, today I'm going to talk about, um, well, I'm going to report about a joint work with uh, Mario Edmundo, Pantelis, uh, Eleutheriou, and, and Vinzier. Um, on homology groups in algebraically closed valued fields. Um, Pantelis and Vince are here and they just told me that they will answer any questions you have, so <laughs> I'm really happy uh, to have uh, a backup here. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to start uh, talking about first about something slightly different, which is uh, cohomology. So if you start um, with a um, complete rank 1, non-trivially, algebraically closed valued field, and you have a variety over k, um, you have seen already in this conference that if you just take the k rational points of this variety and uh, you just um, equip this set with the valuation topology, you get a totally disconnected space, uh, usually not, um, not even locally compact, so there is little hope for uh, trying to, to do cohomology with this topological space. So if you, if you try to define cohomology groups, to say, with singular cohomology, this is going to fail dramatically. And um, well, if you have been following the conference, then you already know what to do when the topological space is bad, then Basically, you, you, you want to take something else, and you could take, for example, you could replace this bad topological space by its Berkovic analytification. Now you recover a locally uh, compact uh, space, and well, in this case, you can, you can study singular cohomology groups using such a space. Um, this is not the only cohomology uh, groups that you can study. Berkovic also defined um, um, et al cohomology using really the, the full analytic structure here, but if you're looking at this object just from a topological point of view, at least you could define um, cohomology groups using just, a, let's say, singular cohomology. And indeed, um, he showed that, um, well, two theorems. The first one is that under strong uh, algebraic assumptions on your variety X, um, the analytification admits a deformation retraction to a finite simplicial complex, so you're you're getting actually nice, um, um, well, you're getting even in simplicial um, um, cohomology will get you something here. But he also showed that the, the, well, the cohomology groups are somehow well behaved. In particular, they're finitely generated. Uh, they do vanish. This is not exactly the same as in, in the complex case. Usually here you have a, a, a two, but in, in this case, they really start vanishing after the dimension of your variety. And, uh, well, since I assume that K is algebraically close, this is perhaps not as, as, as general as the result proved by Berkovich, but if you do have an extension of rank one, then this is invariant uh, undergoing to an extension. But okay, these extensions, um, right, you're, you only get here transcendental extensions if, if you want. His result is a little bit more general because, well, one can define the analytification also over fields which are not algebraically closed. What does it mean rank one? Don't you do it twice and get rank three? Uh, well, it's just that rank one here it just means that the value group is embedded in the in the reals, oh, okay. right? Sorry, yeah. Sorry. So so that the analytification is is well defined, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, so if you have also been following this. Uh, <laughs> This conference, um, one can wonder what happens if your exactly if your valued field is 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 not of rank one, and uh, you have a, perhaps a value group which resembles I don't know the reals squared or something like this. And as, as uh, well, if you know, if if you if you don't, then uh, Udi and Francois uh, gave a, uh, another candidate to replace the role of the Berkovich analytification, namely uh, the hat or the set of uh, the space of uh, stably uh, dominated types, which are the same as the types which are orthogonal to gamma uh, and which are k-definable. Um, and indeed, they, they, when they generalized the, this theorem A of, of Berkovich in a very surprising way. Uh, they show that if, if you have a quasi-projective variety, then this, um, this space admits a prodefinable continuous deformation retraction 
Now, not to a finite simplicial uh, uh, complex, but to a definable subset of, of the um, value group together with infinity. So this is, in, in essence, the, the, the best replacement for a, a finite simplicial complex. In, since definable here, this is a pure divisible abelian group, um, and definable sets are piecewise linear, you're getting somehow the, the right analog to what perhaps a finite simplicial complex should be. Um, and um, what is quite surprising about this theorem is that they, they, they have no assumption on, on, on the variety. The, the theorem of Berkovich assumes not only smoothness, but even the existence of some uh, very nice model of your variety. So this, this was, um, well, it surprised the community at least that, that there was no assumption here. And uh, moreover, their, the, this, this new candidate or their, their avatar of this Berkovich identification is, is, is also faithful in the, in the sense that um, it agrees with the analytification in, in, in some valued fields. So for example, if you started with a, um, a rank one complete uh, valued field and you go to a maximum complete extension which has value group R, this is what I'm calling uh, K max, then um, the analytification of your variety over, over this um, extension is actually homeomorphic to, to the space of stably dominated types in this, in this extension, in this new model. Uh, right. So one could ask, of course, what, what happens with theorem B? Is there now some sort of uh, cohomology, right, for uh, in, in higher rank? Uh, the answer is, at the moment, no, because actually the the, the space of uh, stably dominated types, mo most of the time, is actually still a very bad topological space. Um, already in the case, for example, of the a fine line uh, over CP, this is not locally compact. This is essentially because the value group is Q, and um, the Berkovich analytification is seeing all the real points, but, uh, but the, the, the hat space is, is not. It, it contains all the right information, but as a topological space, it's still bad somehow. So um, nonetheless, if, if, if you replace this topology with the right kind of definable site, um, then we can use the, the, the stably dominated uh, uh, space or, or the space of stably dominated types to retrieve a good sheaf cohomology with, with good properties. And this is what we, um, we proved with uh, Mario and, and Vince is that, well, first of all, you, you, you get a, a cohomology theory for this site, and moreover, in the compact support case, um, uh, this is what we have. So we, we also proved that the, these cohomology groups are finitely generated. They also vanish uh, after the dimension of, of your variety. And, um, well, they are invariant, right? If you take any elementary extension, now that we can work in, in all ranks, if you take an elementary extension, the, the cohomology groups do not change. And moreover, we follow the philosophy of Houdi and Francois is that um, they, they, they do agree, they're faithful in that they, they do agree when, when, when you have a, a, a rank one uh, algebraically closed field. So uh, if you already, if you again go to this, um, maximally um, complete extension with value group the reals, well, these, these two spaces are going to be, oh, I changed my x to v, sorry. These v's should be just x. Um, these two spaces, the, the space of stably dominated types concentrating on v and its analytification are homeomorphic, and our cohomology groups um, are just isomorphic to the ones of the singular cohomology, let's say, they, they agree. Oh, sorry, you should, I mean, this should be x and this should be z, sorry. Or you can think of L as a module over some, right? you can actually change your coefficients. Okay, so, so um, one thing that was kind of a little bit disappointing for us in this work, I mean, we, we, we were really happy to, to, to make this work, but you can see here there, there is this, this, this compact uh, support part, which is not exactly as in the, as in the case of Verkovich. Now let me give you, before, say something more about the, the, the compact support. Um, 
Let me give you something somehow related to, to this. This is a theorem of uh, Basu and Patel. I'm, I'm quoting here a somehow weak version of their theorem. I'm just for the purposes of exposition, I'm their, the theorem is a little bit more general. Um, they prove something about uniform bounds of Betty numbers. So um, if you have a complete rank one uh, non-trivial algebraically closed field, and suppose you have, let's say, a, an algebraic family of varieties parameterized by um, a variety W, then uh, you can bound the Betty numbers of uh, the analytification, where the Betty numbers is just the, you, you can, uh, these, these um, cohomology groups are going to be Q vector spaces, and you can just uh, ask what, what their, their dimension is. And what their theorem says is that um, if, you, if you let run these um, uh, varieties, varieties through, through your parameterized uh, variety W, then they're all bounded. I mean, you, you, you get a uniform bound for all these uh, Betty numbers. And their proof actually uh, uses some of the results of um, Uli and Francois, but somehow um, they somehow missed the, the, a very nice proof of this result. They, they, they used some of the results of uh, Uli and Francois, but th th there was a very nice idea or a very nice proof that they missed. And I, I would like to explain you what, what would be that proof or what could be this proof. So perhaps uh, let me, <laughs> right, thanks. So um, there were uh, early results of, uh, of Basu for uh, bounds, uniform bounds of Betty numbers um, for semi-algebraic sets over um, or minimal expansions of real closed fields. So similar results were already known for uh, semi-algebraic sets in, in expansions of uh, real closed fields or minimal expansions of real closed fields. So, um, right, let me write it that helps. Um, earlier. Results of uh, Basu were like analogs for semi algebraic sets in or minimal expansions of real closed fields. So you could think that you have your um, parameterized family here and you have this deformation retraction. This is the deformation retraction, uh, which can also be done in parameters due to uh, Udi and Francois. And here you're getting some SW, let me put it this way, which is now this definable subset of a power of, of gamma, right? And then you could try to think, okay, well, let me go to an elementary extension of the whole thing, right? Here you have, let's say, your valued field KV, here you have uh, your value group gamma. You could go to an elementary extension uh, K prime V, and here gamma prime, such that here you can actually uh, get a real closed field, right? You could, up to getting, going to an elementary extension, you could perhaps extend your value group to a real closed field. Then here you have your new definable set that you're going to see as a semi-algebraic uh, set. You're going to apply the results uh, of Basu and uh, right here, having here your, this is also the, the same deformation, let's say. And then perhaps you could, if you, if you were invariant, if your cohomology groups are invariant, then you could go back here and get the bounds just using these earlier results. So the only, thing that was somehow missing was this, okay, I mean, here, what they were claiming was actually only for um, singular cohomology. They were not having a cohomology theory that, go, that could go to elementary extensions this way. This is what we obtained, so we were kind of quite happy because this argument, I mean, we were fond of, of this argument. This, this was a nice idea, but we also missed this argument because of the compact support thing. I mean. We, the results are results about just uh, 
I mean, they, they don't have this compact support assumption and our result only has invariance for compact support. So we were having almost the, the, the right thing, but we couldn't actually get it this way because uh, we still don't have uh, invariance for uh, non-compact support. Okay, so a second attempt to, to, to perhaps save this argument um, was, okay, perhaps this, um, perhaps the Betty numbers um, could be now computed with homology instead of cohomology. And perhaps if we prove that homology is well behaved enough, perhaps even we can show that actually our cohomology will have this, um, this property without compact support. And so this somehow led us to, to think a little bit more uh, of homology. And this is perhaps uh, one of the motivations why we started now to look at homology groups, okay? Now, what about homology? Um, in his uh, PhD thesis, uh, Arthur uh, Forheide um, constructed um, the minimal simplicial al singular um, homology in expansions of real closed fields for the category of definable sets. So simplicial is actually for the category of compact definable sets, but uh, then the singular uh, homology is for the full category of definable sets. Um, his construction is essentially based on definable triangulation, so it uses essentially, one more time, multiplication. So um, one cannot just de descend these two divisible order abelian groups uh, free. And, um, well, it, it's not just based on triangulation, but he, one, one, one usually when, when trying to prove things about singular, uh, well, actually to prove that singular, uh, sorry, yes, uh, singular um, homology uh, behaves properly, one, one uses um, a method called simplician approximation and the maps, um, when you try to define, if you have a continuous map, when you try to define the corresponding homomorphism between homology groups, um, you do this simplicial approximation. You show that the maps actually are going to be simplicial and then uh, they're going to be nice homomorphisms in the case of, uh, of the homology groups. Uh, but he could, he could not do this simplicial approximation in, in non-standard models of, uh, of the real. So he replaced one of the key ingredients he was using is that he replaced this by a method of a cyclic models. If you don't know what it is, this just don't worry. Um, this is a technicality on your homological algebra um, in order to get um, nice functoriality uh, in the right category. But one of the inputs or the new inputs of, of his work was uh, really use this method in order to, to get uh, homology. Um, Moreover, later, uh, Mario and, and, uh, and Feuerheide, they showed that actually this homology theory uh, is unique in the sense that if you have any other um, homology theory in the category of definable sets, then it has to be isomorphic uh, to the minimal singular homology. So this was already somehow um, good for us because, okay, we, we don't have multiplication, right? We would like to, to define a homology Oh, before saying that, let, let me perhaps tell you quickly what should be a, a, a tempting strategy. I think this is at the board. Um, the, 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 same, the same strategy I was trying to, to, to use to, to get this uniform bounds could be applied to perhaps define actually homology. Because you could say, okay, you start, you have, uh, even for the moment, forgetting the the, the valued field, you want to define at least homology uh, for gamma, then you start with some definable set, well, you should go to an elementary extension where you have a real closed uh, field, there you can use then uh, for high this uh, um, homology, and then you're going to define the homology this way, and almost by definition is going to be invariant, and is going to satisfy more or less all the properties you would like to satisfy. Um, because it's basically already the singular homology here, or at least the, the it resembles singular homology here. So there are two, two issues here. Well, a minor issue, this is not really that important, but 
Um, here in our case, I, I should actually put always an infinity here. This is not just the, 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 the value group, but, but, the, but the value group with infinity because this deformation retraction is really a deformation retraction here. Okay, so you need to deal a little bit with infinity uh, also when you go to the passage here. This is not so difficult because in a real closed field you could try to see this perhaps as homeomorphic to just the, the square or something like um, zero, one, like this, right, to the n or something like this. But okay, you need to deal with, with infinity some, some way. But more problematically is that if you want to do this, um, this definition, let's say in families, right? Let's say that you have this, this family and you would like to partition your parameter set into pieces such that the homology groups are the same in, in each piece, then this partition might be definable with multiplication here. And you're not going to be able to, to put it down. I mean, in essence, this is not too bad because you still get a partition of your definable set into pieces, but it is not really internal to this world, right? You would, it would be nicer if your definable family is still also linear and all of the data is going to kind of descend again to your original setting. But Pablo, but if you just want to, to have a bound on the petty numbers, but it's sufficient to have a specification of what your family is? That might be true. That might be true. If you, if you just want to prove the, those bounds on the betting numbers, you could perhaps stop here, right? But for other applications, it would be nice if everything is really at the level of, of, of the linearity or really at the level of, of gamma infinity just as a divisible order abelian group. Um, right, you're right. Okay, so this is a tempting strategy, but we, we would like to have something internal. So, so to know if, if there is a way to define uh, homological groups similar to uh, simplicial, but only using the linear structure. Okay, now this is what I'm going to uh, try to tell you. Um, how, how do we do this um, in the rest of the, of the talk? Oh, right. Yes, okay, so for the moment I'm going to talk, I mean, for quite a bit I'm going to only work in gamma and this is going to be kind of a, a, um, a talk about, let's say something, something like tropical homology. It's something like uh, trying to define homology groups in a tropical setting or where you only have, uh, let's say, linear stuff. And what we're going to use basically is to, we're going to try to replace um, triangulation by some special way of decomposing into linear sets. Okay, so now let me give you the definition of a linear cell. So a linear cell uh, in gamma, well, this is defined inductively, a linear cell in gamma is just your usual uh, open intervals or, uh, or points. And now for uh, the inductive step, uh, if you get a linear cell X, a subset of uh, gamma N minus one, then a linear cell in gamma N is going to be just either the, the graph of a linear function restricted to this linear cell or the cylinder, so everything which is in between uh, F and G for two linear functions uh, such that F restricted to X is smaller than G restricted to X. Yes, that's a good question. Actually, what, what we, I'm presenting things here as, as, as gamma is always just a, um, a, a pure divisible uh, abelian group. So this would be with coefficients in, in Q, but it is a little bit more general. You can, you can make this into a, um, what, division, module. division module, right over, yes, exactly. But for simplicity, let me say the coefficients are just in, in Q. Right. Okay, and if, if needed, I, I'm, I'm going to the, refer to such sales as, uh, well, the graph of X over X, uh, sorry, the graph of X, yes, over X, and the cylinder of F and G over X. Now, what, what, what are these special linear cell decompositions I, we would like to use instead of triangulation? This is what I'm going to define here. It's a little bit technical, but I, I'll try to to, to give you the, the intuition. 
So a special linear cell decomposition is going to, um, uh, to be defined also uh, recursively uh, as follows. So for, um, for gamma, we say that um, any decomposition uh, into linear cells of uh, a given set subset, a given subset of gamma is going to be just a special linear cell decomposition. So your, your usual decomposition of uh, set Y into points and intervals, this is just a special. So in the line, nothing is really happening. Now, in the inductive space, uh, we have a decomposition of Y. So this is a, a partition, right? A collection of subsets, definable subsets of Y uh, into linear cells. So the the partition is into linear cells, and we call it a special linear cell decomposition if these three um, conditions hold. The first one is that uh, pi here is the projection onto your first n minus one coordinates. And we say that the projection of each of the cells is going to give you also a special linear cell decomposition of the projection of your set. So this is somehow, um, right, the, 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 the projection give, gives you again one of these nice decompositions. And now come these two properties which um, basically tell you or um, they, 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 they tell you that your cells in the border are kind of well, well behaved. Perhaps let, let me give you an example of these examples of these two. It's going to be easier. Um, Okay, for the, for the first one, so it says that if you have any two graphs um, in your decomposition such that in the projection one of these cells is included in the closure of the other. So suppose, I don't know, suppose this is the projection, right? You have one cell which is um, uh, the interior, this is the, the, the cell T, and suppose this here is S, right? And S now is included in the interior of T, right? And suppose you have a graph uh, over T. So suppose you have some, um, right, some graph like this, right? This is perhaps the graph uh, of a function over T. And you have another graph put over S. What it's saying is that the graph over S, of, of, over S cannot be something like, like this way, right? It cannot be in the middle, it cannot kind of be above and, and below this, this line here, right? So they have to be either here, either here, but not kind of in between, more or less. Okay, so the, the 3D picture is a little bit difficult, but okay. Exactly, I want it to be somehow a simplex. So in this way, you, you will need to partition again this into something like this or something like this. I don't know, you need to keep partitioning until your pieces are going to be not touching the wrong way somehow. And for the last one, the, the part three, let me do this not in, in dimension three, but in dimension two, suppose you have a cylinder uh, like this, it, it prevents to, to have two cylinders which are looking like this. So your cylinder here should not end in the middle of a cylinder like this, right? So either you, you chop here again, or you need to do something, but you, the third condition is preventing you to have this kind of behavior of two, of two cells. Okay? So... When you pick the plot again, the line might not exist, right? I mean, you cannot assume that there's a line for any two points. You're right, you're right. But, but I mean, if, if this is, you're right. But if, the, if this is linear, what I'm doing is not chopping, but kind of continuing, prolonging this one, and then trying to make here two cylinders and so on. Right, you're right. Correct. Okay. So those are the type of, of decompositions. Yes. No, 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 no. Just. I think just 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 the n minus one, right? Yes. I guess you could make it for every projection with a bit of work, but I don't think we use it uh, in the proofs. Right. Okay, and um, the theorem is a theorem of, uh, of Pantelis uh, using previous work of himself and Mario and Luca Prelli is that every definable partition of, uh, of gamma to the n can be refined into a special linear cell decomposition. So this is exactly what it should replace um, triangulation, okay? 
Okay. Now, let me try, I, I will try to define you now what are going to be the chain complexes which are going to give us uh, the homology groups. So, the idea is that, um, right, let me walk you through, through, the, through the construction first. Um, we're going to first define um, a homology for compact sets, for, so for closed and bounded uh, sets in, in gamma. And then using that one, we're going to be able to uh, define it for general definable sets uh, using limits. So first, I'm going to define also the, only these um, uh, chain complexes for uh, definably locally closed subsets um, of gamma um, with respect to a given uh, special linear cell decomposition. Then later, there is a bit of work to show that uh, in the case of uh, closed and bounded sets, they do not depend on the cell, uh, linear cell decomposition, and once you have that, then you're going to have your homology. It's basically the, the, the sketch of the, of the construction. Okay, so, um, so we have X uh, definably locally closed set. Here, locally closed only means the intersection of a definable closed with a definable open. Um, and you get D, which is a, a special linear cell decomposition uh, respecting your, your set X. So it also partitions your set X. We let uh, DI denote the subset uh, of your partition of those cells which have dimension exactly I. Okay. Now for each I, uh, from 0 to M, we're going to define this group, so the ith group uh, with respect to X uh, and this uh, special linear cell decomposition D to be the free abelian group generated by the, the following elements. So you have elements from A0 up to AM minus I, and they have to satisfy this condition. Perhaps I will also do a, an example. This is easier, easier to see. So for example, suppose your um, your set X is the, this, this closed uh, square, right? You have this closed square. So for example, in, uh, in A0, you're going to have this point here could be an alpha zero, right? So your, your first condition says that, oh, if, oh, my point is not, okay. Your, Right, the first condition says that alpha zero has to be included in X. X is the, the whole uh, closed square, right? Then the, and in this case, the dimension of, um, of alpha zero has to be, well, zero plus zero has to be zero, and this is correct, this is a point, right? Then the next one, alpha one, is going to be an element, alpha one has to be an element of dimension, uh, in this case, one. But it also has to satisfy that alpha one, sorry, that alpha zero has to be in the closure of alpha one. So in this case where there are two, very basically two, exactly two elements which are going to be such that alpha zero is in their closure and of dimension one. So you could take perhaps this one to be alpha one and finally alpha two would be perhaps this one, right? And then this triple like this, uh, alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, is going to be one of the generators of this free uh, abelian group. So these are flags of uh, from the thing of closed cells. Are you exactly, okay. exactly. You could think of, of them this way. Yes. Uh, okay. Now we want to uh, mod out by by a subgroup, and this is the subgroup. Uh, the subgroup now AI prime which is uh, generated by the following elements. So you take uh, the sums of uh, your generators for which they start exactly the same up to a, a point j minus one, and then they differ. But always they must have at least the very first one equal. Okay? Okay, very good. Then for, of course, for uh, I is smaller than zero, we set these two groups to be just zero. And now we define the group CIX 
d to be the quotient of these two groups. Okay, we're modding out precisely uh, all the generators by, by, by these sums where up to a certain point uh, they were equal and now they differ. Okay, so right, for example, if I, if I add in, in this case, I could have also, if I call this, this one here, if I call it alpha one prime, then I would have alpha zero, alpha one prime, and alpha two, right? The same alpha two would be another generator, right? And then I'm modding out by exactly by their sum. If, if I take, if, I mean, these two should count only once. I, I should, their sum should, should not be allowed in the, in the counting uh, for, for, the, for the group. D doesn't matter. The, 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 no, no, no. The important is that th they start at some point deferring for, for the first one, right? And then they could still have the same uh, alpha 2, right? Yes. OK. Um, now um, I should now define you with what is going to be the, the derivative or the, the, the map which is going to connect these groups. So. Of course, re recall that what I'm going to use is, is, is these groups here, but uh, well, th since this is a quotient, I'm going to define first the homomorphism here and then show that the homomorphism re respects the subgroup and then it's going to induce a homomorphism in the, in the quotient. So the homomorphism is, is the following. is uh, precisely, oh, I should have changed, let, let me explain what is this notation. Um, okay, so any of the generators is going to be sent to, to this sum. Recall that you're going from the AI to the AI minus one. So here the generators have one coordinate more, right? Then you're sending this generator to the sum of all possible, uh, this, here you get exactly the same tuple, but you could get another beta which is of a smaller dimension, right? And you're taking all the betas such that, well, the condition is that beta has to be included in X, and this basically means exactly, sorry, I, I, I should have uh, said this notation, this means beta is of dimension I minus one, and um, beta is included in the closure of alpha zero. So th those are the conditions exactly of uh, all, e all possible elements which appear as generators in this group having the, the this end part equal to your the, the 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 input of your homomorphism, okay. And what I was saying is that um, sorry. Ah, this is precisely the definition of AI minus one because recall that the generators were going from alpha zero up to uh, alpha m minus i, so. So you're getting one more, right? Yeah. Oh, it's good, it's good. Um, OK, so this, this homomorphism uh, maps the subgroup to the subgroup. So we do have an induced homomorphism in, in, in the quotient. And now this is uh, what we really take as the derivative. And the first theorem uh, that we showed is that uh, taking this um, uh, for a locally, definably locally closed subset, gives you uh, a chain complex. So this really uh, uh, vanishes when you compose uh, the partial i with partial i minus one. Let me tell you something interesting here is that, well, the, the, the key lemma to show this is, is, is the following. We, for um, historical reason, this uh, started, we, we started to be calling this the alpha, beta, gamma <laughs> lemma. And uh, it's the following. Uh, I'll, I'll try to do also a picture for this. Perhaps I have the time. So it says, I hope you can still read while I'm doing the example. So it says that if you have a, a, a linear um, cell decomposition, a special linear cell decomposition, and um, you have three cells of consecutive dimensions, so you're the dimension of alpha, let's say, is i, the dimension of beta is i minus one and the dimension of gamma is i minus two. And 
they lie in their closures, in their closures, res re closures uh, respectively. So suppose, I don't know, you have perhaps something like this. Um, you have this, perhaps this triangle, something like this, and um, inside this is going to be alpha, so the, the uh, interior of this uh, prism is going to be alpha, so it has dimension uh, three, let's say. Uh, take for example uh, now um, beta to be this side here, so the dimension of beta is going to be two, and you can take, for example, this line. Ah, perhaps I should take a color. Might help. So this is going to be uh, gamma, and um, this side here is going to be beta, right? Um, the lemma says that there's going to be only one other, exactly one other uh, cell in your decomposition which is going to also have, so there's going to be another beta prime satisfying two things. Well, uh, beta prime has to be included in the closure of alpha, perhaps three things. Uh, beta prime has to be different than beta, and also gamma has to be in the closure of beta prime, and sorry, four things, and it has to be of the right dimension has to be here too. And in this case, well, you see that the only one is going to be the floor. The floor here is the only one which is uh, touching gamma, uh, different than beta, but also in the closure of alpha. And this uniqueness, the uniqueness of this beta prime is what actually makes this to be really a chain complex. This is what is going to make everything kind of in the computation uh, get into the kernel. And well, at the very beginning of, 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 of this uh, project, of course, we wanted to prove this for, for gamma infinity, not just for gamma. And for, I don't know for how long, six or more months, we, were, we proved this for, for gamma, and we were saying, okay, for gamma infinity, it has to be just a little bit more complicated. And it kept to be more complicated, more complicated, until we discovered it was false. <laughs> This was quite recent. This is a, I don't know, we found a counterexample in dimension six um, <laughs> last, last, last week or so. So to define the homology in gamma infinity, one has to do something different. I mean, I, I was a bit shocked by, by this. Um, yeah, Pantelis and, 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 and Mario, um, well, Pantelis had the idea of trying to prove this with a different approach, the one we were using, and it was using, I mean, his proof approach that we discovered that this was false. But okay, in, in gamma, everything still uh, works. Okay, so we obtain now, um, now with this chain complex, we can define the homology groups as uh, usual. We take just the uh, quotient of this kernel and image and this is going to be the ith uh, cohomology group for, for the chain complex that I gave you. Okay, now I already defined you the homology groups for uh, definably closed, uh, locally closed uh, subsets, but with respect to a given uh, linear cell decomposition. So what comes next is um, kind of a, a bit technical, um, but is the way um, one can show that um, this does not depend on the special linear cell decomposition. So bear with me a, a couple of minutes more and I'll, I'll give you this kind of abstract explanation why this happens, but I won't give all the details of, of, of how this is done. But this is basically where this idea of the acyclic models uh, appear. So first, what you do is um, that you, uh, you, do a, you define a relative chain complex for pairs. So you take a relatively close uh, subset of A, you take now a special linear cell decomposition which, that respects both A and X, and you're able to show that um, the homology, uh, well, the chain complex with respect to A is a subcomplex with respect to X, and then with this you're able to define relative uh, 
uh, homology groups for this pair. And these are going to be a little bit more uh, flexible. And um, this is what you, what you want to use in, in this theorem, uh, sorry, in this uh, method of uh, acyclic models. And what you show, I mean, the, what, what is going to play the role of the models are um, the closures of, uh, of cells in a, a special linear cell decomposition. So this is, to some extent, what uh, the, the role of simplices uh, should play. So we show that if you have an SLD and you have a, a cell in an SLD, um, especially in a cell decomposition, um, if this cell is uh, bounded, sorry, yes, of bounded cells, if this cell is bounded, then um, the homology group groups um, vanish for all uh, i bigger than, than zero. And well, the, the trick, this, this is the way it works, one, one uses this acyclicity to, to define well-induced group homomorphisms uh, having a definable, so if you give me a definable continuous map from these pairs, and uh, the notation of these pairs means that the image of the uh, closed, relatively closed set here uh, is inside the relatively closed set for Y, then using this lemma, I can't, ex can't explain exactly why, I mean that this is a kind of technical bit of homological algebra, you're able, after some work, to define a, um, a well-induced group homomorphism um, between these, these two homologies, well, between the homology groups. And using this, then, one can show the, the theorem I was um, mentioning. Then there is a homology theory in the category of pairs of closed and bounded definable subsets of gamma, let's say with coefficients in Z, such that uh, if XA is such a pair, then uh, if you get a, a special linear cell decomposition respecting both X and A, then, well, this is basically saying that it is independent of the, of the special linear cell decomposition you get. And it is functorial in, in the way you expect. Okay, so, right. So this is the result for closed and bounded, right? Well, and of course you define, if you give me an X, if I put A equal to X, then this is the way I define the, the cohomology for just one uh, closed and bound definable set, okay? Now for a, rare, a general definable set, what we do is, is, is take limits. So um, if I have uh, X a, a definable subset and A a relatively closed definable subset, then I'm going to define the homology as the limit over uh, all closed and bounded K um, subsets of X. And here I just take the, the, the intersection, which is still going to be closed and, and bounded. And well, more homological algebra is going to uh, give you that this, this, this limit definition is going to commute with whatever you want and uh, basically is, is, is going to, to make the, the, the homology work. And um, right, this, this, this part says basically that the, the homomorphisms, the, the way you constructed this homomorphi group homomorphisms is also going to give you a homomorphism between now these two general X and Y definable subsets. So with this definition, we're able to now get a, a homology for the full category of pairs of definable subsets, where A is a relatively close subset of X, um, which extends the, the homology I just defined for the category of pairs of closed and bounded definable subsets. And uh, for this um, uh, homology, we're able to show that it, it, it behaves uh, well, at least in the case of definably locally closed subsets. So um, we have a vanishing condition, the, the homology of a definable set when it is def locally closed um, is going to vanish after if, di if its dimension. Hello? Yes. Well, in this case, A is just A equals to X, right? Yeah, good. Yes, this, I mean, you take A equal to X to define the, yes. Um, okay, each, each of these homology groups is going to be finitely generated, and also we get this, um, uh, this invariance uh, under elementary extension. So we're really, really close to 
to, to get the proof <laughs> that we really want it, except we're still missing it because, because of the issue of infinity, right? So we, we do get almost a proof, let's say, for example, if you're, the varieties you're starting with are smooth, perhaps, and then you know that the deformation retraction is going to just to gamma, then you can recover perhaps some of these results. But of course, what you would like is to have this, this in general. So this is now, oh, right, I should have still some minutes. Let me give you at least in gamma, before going to gamma infinity, um, two more theorems about this homology. One is that it, it, it does uh, behave well in families. So if you give me a family of definable, uh, a definable family of uh, definably locally closed uh, subsets of gamma M, then you can find a, a definable partition uh, of your parameter set such that um, on each of these uh, subsets, uh, the homology groups are, uh, are the same. So this, this I mean, the, the, the argument that we were wanting to have, uh, it's going to work properly in, in families. And um, a comparison result which was expected is that in the case where you started, uh, started here with a, uh, let's say, a divisible order abelian group which can be uh, expanded into a real closed field, then our homology um, coincides with the um, semi-algebraic uh, simplicial homology in, in R, with the singular homology in, in R. So we're I mean, what we were expecting is, is happening. We're not defining a, a strange new uh, homology. Okay, now for gamma infinity, <laughs> let me say this is work in, work in progress. Um, some of my co-authors might, might put a different uh, percentage. I'm, <laughs> I, I have to say, it. I mean, I'm, I mean, at the optimistic side of the spectrum of this uh, percentage, but I think this should work. I mean, g given the, the, the fact that the, 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 the main idea that we were having for defining this homology failed <laughs> last week, you could say this should not be a 70%, but there are other ways in which we can perhaps retrieve um, the result for, for gamma infinity. So I'm, I'm hopeful this, this, the, the, the same result is, is going to work once you add um, infinity. And uh, of course, actually, the, the, the second one should be a conditional percentage, right? If, <laughs> if, if this is true, this, 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 this should follow that directly. No, I hope not. No, no, no. No, no, this is not, not, not this percentage. <laughs> right. So um, now the difficult part, of course, is, is the first one, is, is, to, is to show that there is really a, a whole homology uh, theory in gamma infinity. And let me perhaps say, I still have two minutes? Okay. Um, there is a way also using limits, there is a way you could define the homology groups for uh, gamma infinity, and this will at least perhaps give you again the bounds. But it would be nicer to have a full homology theory because this is actually the way one can define uh, properly a homology in ACVF. I mean, the whole point of this was to define homology and homology groups in ACVF, and so far I have only talked about, <laughs> about gamma or gamma infinity, um, but um, if you do get a full homology in gamma infinity, well, you can use again the, the, the work of Foudy and Francois to, to, to provide a, a homology for definable sets for, for, for the stable uh, completions um, in ACVF, because essentially they showed a, an equivalence of categories. Um, between exactly the, those, the category C gamma, which is the category of definable subsets of uh, gamma infinity, um, and the morphisms are definable continuous maps. So this is precisely our category, let's say, or the category we will define the homology, uh, this homology, and uh, the category of uh, semi-algebraic subsets of, uh, of hats of uh, quasi-projective varieties, where the morphisms are just pro-definable continuous uh, maps. And well, if you, if you take the corresponding homotopy categories of these two, this is basically you, you, you keep the same objects, but you change uh, the maps. So you factor the maps by, uh, by homotopy. Then their theorem is that these two categories are equivalent. So 
using, using this equivalence of categories, one can transfer the homology from here uh, to here. And then our beloved argument would be <laughs> really complete. Um, right, and we could get these uniform bounds of Betty numbers uh, as, as we want it in all ranks, also not, ju not just in rank one. And perhaps this can also be used to, to, to improve the, the results we have for cohomology um, uh, without compact support, but okay, I'm, I'm not going to say this. Um, I think this, this is all I wanted to say. Are there questions for Pablo? And what about a possible uh, shift theoretic uh, approach with using a growth and topology with definable subsets either in the evaluative setting or the minimal setting and uh, considering the really the, uh, homology, the shift theoretic uh, cohomology of Z or, or something like that? What do you mean? You, you, you mean a shift theoretic homology? Yes. Or, well, that in essence, we, you could think that that might be the, the, the dual of the one we define already um, before, and so I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, on the top of my head, I will say this, maybe the tools we have might not give us the, 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 the full picture, or at least perhaps would give us something only for compact support again, but, but it, it might work. I, I, I don't think we have really uh, tried the, the Right, uh, a shift theoretic homology there. This is this is for cohomology, but we we right we didn't try it from 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 scratch. Let's say uh, to define um, homology using um, a site. Yes. So one question. My question is very vague. I found it amazing that you're somehow able to do it almost in a very natural way, never mentioning orientation in this respect. So can you explain, presumably there's some map that gives them one of these flags that gives an orientation, but what is it? Um, in fact, if you had a plus and not a minus in the emission, yeah, but what, how, how does it work? Right, I guess, okay, I, 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 right, I, I, I agree, I agree. There is no orientation, but perhaps this is hidden somehow in, in, in the definition of, of I mean, in the definition, the, the, the way these generators are, are defined. I'm not, I'm not fully sure. Um, yeah, so you, yeah. My right? Why, why, the, why there is no orientation there? Perhaps this is your question. Well, maybe, maybe there is. I mean, maybe given a flag, you can find an orientation and somehow show that uh, it has to flip sign when you change up the plane. Uh, I, I guess, I guess perhaps is the, 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 the uniqueness, the uniqueness of this beta, which makes, um, right, which, which is going to make somehow that the sign does not does not matter. I mean, I'm not fully sure. That, that yeah, um, it's a good question. Yes. I, I'm not sure, but I would say that uh, it's uh, um, sometimes doing uh, uh, when you do simplicial stuff. Uh, uh, in fact, so you have uh, orientation is hidden in the fact that you're dealing with flags, uh, and this is exactly what you're doing. You're using flags. And so flags, uh, in some sense, should uh, replace uh, orientation. Right. Yeah. Right. So but, it's uh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm saying. Uh, I have another thing I wanted to add. I mean, the ideal setting would be to have a six-factor formalism uh, in the category of. Uh, of to have a what? Sorry, yeah. Six-factor formalism. Course. So this is. This is uh, this should be the ultimate This is goal. what we're trying to head to at some point, right? To right. I mean, to, even the project to the long term is to have some sort of algebraic topology developed with with, with these spaces, right? I mean, 
we would love to define properly the fundamental group and we'll develop a... The other thing is I wanted to comment without understanding anything about it, so I really, really don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, I'm not surprised that going to gamma infinity is more difficult. And it, what it reminds me of, which I don't know, but I, I think there's a growth in the purely algebraic definition of the RAM cohomology, which is done by a kind of hyper cohomology. Namely, you already have, I mean, the, the, the infinity sets, the sets that come, that have some coordinate at infinity, mm -hmm. they're really analogous to Zorisky closed sets. So in, so in some sense, um, you know, just the information of, well, of these sets at infinity gives you some kind of Zorisky topology where you don't have anything on the open uh, things. And, and then the, so, and then, Combining these two is non-trivial. It's kind of hyper, you know, hyper cohomology situation where you have a sheath value in thieves. Um, yeah, hey, but this yeah. Can I can I ask you something? Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, I think the, the, the <laughs> ultimate dream it would be because here you're only looking at topology from the gamma side. I mean, that you have also the the ray side and. And there you have uh, more algebraic uh, structures like a talc homology. And so the ultimate dream would be to, to mix this. To, and uh, maybe what Udi uh, was just, is just mentioning that, in fact, uh, at looking at gamma infinity, you already see a small uh, appearance of the fact that the way uh, the two topologies interact is not uh, completely trivial. Yeah, that might, that might might be a good point. It's true that, that we're um, essentially doing something similar to what Mariana was saying. We're uh, forgetting what is happening in the residue field and for the moment only looking at, uh, <laughs> at the tropical side of the picture. Um, yeah, I, I, there is... Well, there is, there is something that we, we, we have vaguely mentioned in, in discussions is that well, for example, here the vanishing is not at the right, the right vanishing, right? You, you have, yeah. you, this is vanishing not at, uh, at twice the dimension. So you would like to perhaps have something like a talco homology for, for these spaces, but, but there is not yet the, the, what should be the analytic structure on, 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 on these spaces, right? So perhaps this comes from the residue field that would be something different, right? Something, I mean, you, you don't get into analyticity, but perhaps make enter a talcomology from the residue field. Yes, probably, perhaps you have that, that's a good idea. I, I haven't really thought about this. Perhaps you have some theory of a talcomology or something like that on the RV objects and not on the uh, gamma mm -hmm. objects. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, not um, so, um, a good candidate. I think we should take a little break. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure Pablo is very happy to, to continue this discussion over coffee and uh, we'll uh, reconvene in five minutes. <laughs>